Well, thank you very much. I would ask for prayer for the ongoing gospel efforts. We have been at uh, the Morn Country Hotel in Newry and uh, Valley Willwell, and uh, today I was speaking at the Banbridge Academy. Uh, Lord willing, tomorrow noon over uh, a business lunch in Enniskillen and other gospel efforts in the coming week. We would appreciate your prayers uh, for those engagements as well. Well, we're thinking this evening about spiritual gifts. And uh, a few nights ago, we were talking about unity and how that unity is beautifully illustrated in the 133rd Psalm, which says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the holy anointing oil, made of different spices, but united by that olive oil, a picture of the Holy Spirit, mingling together the various characteristics, the, each spice providing its own aroma to be mingled together into that beautiful perfume which came from the head and went all the way to the hem. And how we see this beautiful influence of the Lord Jesus by his spirit in our lives not neutralizing the Christians. The way to have unity is not to have unanimity, but to have that sweet reasonableness that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in taking each diverse character with different gifts and different personalities and blending them together into a whole in such a way that it becomes more beautiful than it would have been individually. And so that picture is given to us in the holy anointing oil. But the 133rd Psalm goes on and says that the unity of the saints is also like the dews of Hermon. The, the moisture that came down upon this, the highest mountain at the northeast corner of the land of Israel, from which these little droplets of rain and of dew would mingle together and eventually form little rivulets and then eventually little creeks and eventually uh, form the sources of the Jordan River, the Dan, the Banyas, and the Hasbani, and they flow together, eventually forming the upper Jordan into Lake Hula, dropping down into the Sea of Galilee. Galilee is a, a beautiful spot for anyone who's been there. It's, it's lush, it's subtropical, it's already 750 feet below sea level, and they're growing around its shores, um, uh, bananas and uh, pineapples and uh, avocados. Halfway up the hill, however, it's temperate zone and they're growing peaches and apples on the same hillside. And that whole region, all the way down to the Negev, is watered by the dews of Hermon. The national water system pumps the water up and sends it throughout the whole land. Now the idea is that God blesses me and he doesn't bless me so I'll be blessed. Not entirely. He blesses me that in blessing me through my life will flow the blessing of God into the lives of others. In fact, one of the reasons our prayers are not answered is that we want to use the answer on ourselves to fulfill our own desires. And God says, I won't answer prayers like that. I want to answer prayers where you're asking the Lord to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. That's what God wants. And the purpose of gift in the lives of God's people is to bless us in such a way that we become the vehicles, the channels of blessing to others. Now you see how this works. If God uses me in blessing you, and God uses you in blessing me, then we have a vested interest in each other, don't we? When there's the possibility of a war somewhere on the other side of the world, those businessmen who have a vested interest in that country become very nervous. And when they hear people saying, go over there and blast it back into the 19th century, <laughs> they say, wait a minute, let's talk. We don't want to do that. And so you see, if I have a vested interest in your life and then we start to have some problems, I can't say, good riddance, he's nothing but trouble, let him go. I say, wait a minute, brother, you can't leave. I've poured my life into you. 
I have a vested interest in your success. And so the idea is that just as that water flows not simply onto the land, but is channeled so that it flows throughout the whole land, it's not only fragrant, this unity of the brethren, it's fruitful. It produces fruit in the lives of God's people. And as that fruit is produced, we realize that we're just the branches. We're just the, the channels through which the life of God, the blessing of God has flowed into the lives of others. So that's what we're going to be thinking about tonight. Now you know that Romans chapter 12 begins with the verse that our brother quoted in his prayer. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. It's the smart thing to do. It's your reasonable service. It makes sense to do it. So it begins with your bodies, but it's not too many verses until Paul shifts gears and he starts to talk about his body. And he explains to us that the purpose of our giving our bodies to him is that he might use our bodies to extend his body, to, to grow his body in the world. And that's his intention, that we might grow up into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ, that the, that the body of Christ might continue to grow, encompass, encompassing sinners saved by grace and constantly enlarging this number of people who are vitally connected to the head and who become, in addition, blessings to others. And so the blessing continues. I want to read, however, uh, a little section in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 by way of introduction. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll read from verse 1. If you have a King James, you will notice that the word gifts is in italics. That is a little clue that the word itself is not in the text. Uh, the translators thought it would be helpful, but he's not, while he is going to be speaking about spiritual gifts, I think the original idea is now concerning spirituality, brethren. You know, it's not enough to have spiritual gift. You can exercise your gift in a very unspiritual way. The fact that you have a gift, you may exercise it. So, you know, we should never forget that some of the most spectacular sermons in the Old Testament were preached by Balaam, who was not a saved man at all. And so it's quite possible to exercise my gifts, but to be carnal, to be acting in the energy of the flesh. And this was the problem in Corinth, wasn't it? They were getting up and showing off with their gifts. Look, at I, look what I can do. I can, I can speak in Swahili. And they were showing off with their gifts. And so Paul is going to show them a better way the way of love, the way of love which doesn't promote itself, doesn't advertise itself, doesn't want its own way. And so he begins by saying, what I want to talk about is true spirituality. This is the fundamental issue. If this is right, then your spiritual gift will be exercised in the right way. So that's going to be, if you will, the punchline, and he's going to get to that in chapter 13. Now, for the sake of time, let's read in verse uh, 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations or ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations or power or results or effectiveness. But it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every one to profit with all, meaning for all to profit. Everyone has been given a gift. The objective is your gift is for others' profit, not for yours. And then he goes on to describe various gifts and concludes in verse 11, all these work that one and the selfsame Spirit dividing to everyone severally as he will, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. And so he says, the body is one. However, in verse 14, the body is not one member. It is many members. 
So it's one body, but one body with many members. And then he goes on to describe this strange situation where you have a body that is one big eyeball, or a body that is one big ear, or one big foot, or one big nose. And it's really quite a grotesque thing. You can imagine visiting uh, the hospital to see someone's new baby and say, uh, is that yours? <laughs> one huge eyeball. It would be a ghastly thing to see, wouldn't it? And, and so Paul is using this dramatic language to say, ladies and gentlemen, we don't just need one gift, we need all the gifts. We need everyone to be exercising their gift. We don't just want one big tongue telling us what to do. We want every part of the body working together. We need one another. He comes to the end of his little section, has another description of the list of gifts, and this time he, he gives them in what he considers to be uh, a logical order. Uh, and then he concludes in verse 31, a rather difficult verse perhaps, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Well, you read that verse and you wonder how does that fit in with the rest of the chapter? Because we've been told in verse uh, 11, all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every one severally as he will. The spirit gives gifts as he will. I don't go and say, please, pretty please, give me this gift. The Spirit gives gifts as he understands the need of the body. Well, then what does this verse mean? I would suggest to you that the word you, which is inferred between the words but and covet, ought to be in the text. But you covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. That's what they were doing. They weren't supposed to do that. They wanted the showy gifts. They wanted the public gifts. And the Lord was saying, that's what you're doing. I want to show you the better way, says Paul. And of course, that's what chapter 13 is all about, the better way. In between the two sections that we have referred to that describe the, the various parts of the body and the issue of speciality in the body and some people thinking that, that all we need is one or two gifts and my gift isn't very important, Paul has another little section, verses 23 and 24, talking about the hidden parts. And he says, don't you know that when you walk into someone's house, there are photos on the wall, they don't put x-rays up there. Uh, this is my kidney, this is my Aunt Mary's lungs here. This is, we, we don't do that, do we? we put faces up there. But the hidden organs are what keeps Aunt Mary alive. We don't often think of them. We, we don't go to bed at night saying, oh Lord, thank you for my pancreas, until it gets sick. And then all of a sudden we do think about our pancreas, don't we? We have all of these wonderful parts in the body and quite frankly, we, we hardly ever think of them until they begin to malfunction. And that's the beauty of the body. I don't have to lie awake at night and say, heart pump, heart pump, please, please, please keep pumping. I, I can relax because God has designed the body in such a beautiful way that all the parts carry on doing their work just exactly as they should. Sometimes, because they are hidden, and we don't see them when we look in the mirror in the morning, we forget about them. And the same is true with the body. That there are organs, there are parts, there are members of the body that go on functioning week after week, month after month, year after year, we never notice them. We only notice them when the brother dies and then the work doesn't get done and we wonder, oh, I guess he must have been doing that. <laughs> and we save all our nice words for these Christians at their funerals instead of encouraging them while they're alive and noticing the things that they're doing. So Paul would give us a little word of encouragement to open our eyes and to see the things that are going on all around us and we hardly notice them. They're the hidden members and those hidden members, he says, they're more important, you know, in many ways. We put the emphasis on the preacher who comes to town and stands up there in the pulpit. But you know what brings people back to your local fellowship? You know what brings people out to hear the gospel? It's the sister who shows hospitality. It's the, the Christian who goes out of their way to, to say, I, I pray for you every day. Or people who just remember their names and warmly receive them. Those are the things that are winsome, aren't they? And we need them. We had a sister in our assembly, 
And when a visitor came, a stranger visited, uh, she got the name. And if they came back five or ten years later, she'd walk up to them and greet them by name. She was invaluable. It showed that she cared about those people. And so there are hidden organs. They're not the spectacular ones. They're not the ones that are out in public view. But they are absolutely essential to the health of the body. And we have to remember all of them when we think about the body. Well, in this little second section here, uh, under spiritual gifts distinguished, uh, we do know that the Spirit has given a special gift to every believer. Every believer is gifted. We've read that, haven't we, in verse 7 of, of chapter 12? The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every one so that all may profit. Every child in the family of God is a gifted child. But we have to distinguish as to what a gift is. And one of the best ways is to, first of all, think about what a gift isn't. First of all, a gift is not a natural talent. Natural talents come by physical birth. Spiritual gifts come by the new birth. Natural talents should be put on the altar just like spiritual gifts. And sometimes the spiritual gift and the natural talent can be used together. Someone who has a, an ability to write may use that ability to write gospel literature or to encourage the saints in teaching. Not every preacher knows how to write. I found that out publishing a magazine. And so there are people who have a special ability to write. It's linked with the gift of evangelism or the gift of teaching, and they use their natural talent and their spiritual gift together. Someone may have a beautiful voice to sing, and they use it out in the open air or uh, in hospitals or in, uh, in old folks' homes or whatever it might be. They use that voice in conjunction with their spiritual gift. But we should keep the two distinct. And one of the ways to do it is to ask, which ones can be shared with unbelievers? They get their natural talents too. And so singing, for example, or writing well, or speaking well, these are natural talents. But spiritual gifts are things that only believers can do. Only a believer can show Christian mercy. Only a believer can explain the gospel. Only a believer can teach the saints, and so on. These are supernatural spiritual gifts, and we'll see what they are a little bit later. And then secondly, a gift is not an office. And I've got that word in quotation marks. We thought about it the other night. It's really uh, a responsibility, a stewardship that God gives to certain men to be elders or to be deacons, for example, in the life of the local church. And when they take that office, that's not specifically a gift. Each elder will have different gifts to be used in the life of the local church. And so uh, it's not simply gift that qualifies a man to be an elder. He may be a very gifted man, but he may not be an elder. Because you'll notice at the end of paragraph number two there, they must also be scripturally, morally, domestically, and socially suited for it. And we'll get into that in lesson seven when we look at the subject of elders. Number three, a gift is not a fruit. The fruit of the spirit and gifts are both from the spirit, but they're very different. Gift is an outward demonstration of the work of the Spirit. The manifestation of the Spirit, it's called in verse 7, right? The, the unveiling, the outward working of the Spirit of God. That's a gift. But fruit is an inward development. It has to do not so much, as we've noticed here, with uh, others benefiting from my ministry, but my own character development. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. This is inward working. And then uh, the gift is his work through me, and fruit is his work in me. And I mentioned like the bell and the pomegranate around the garment of the high priest. A bell and a pomegranate in perfect balance. The bell speaks of the testimony of the life, the witness of the life, and the pomegranate speaks of the fruitfulness of the life. And they both have to be there. There are some people who go around making a lot of noise uh, for Christ, you know, but there's no fruit in their life to prove it. And there are other people, and, they're, and they have a, a rich character, and they, and they know the Lord, but for some reason they're afraid to speak of him. We need both in our lives. We need the outward declaration, the outward display of the work of the Spirit of God in the exercise of our gift, and we need the inward working of the Spirit in the development of our character. 
And then number four, a gift is not a ministry. And here's where we notice these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different results, but the same God. So you see the Trinity at work here in giftedness. Different gifts. These are the tools that God gives me for the job. This is the work of the Spirit of God. He equips me with the tools that I need. But then the Lord Jesus steps in and he sends me on a task, a ministry that suits the gifts, suits the tools that I've been given. And then thirdly, God the Father comes along behind and he controls the results, the blessings, the benefits that come as the result of the exercise of my gift. So these are three different areas of work. If we could supernaturally subdivide the crowd into gift, if somehow I put on special glasses and I could see, ah, look at this, uh, here's Brother uh, uh, McKellen here and he obviously has the gift of giving. And uh, I just happened to see that, you know, supernaturally somehow. And I could subdivide the group up into their various gifts, all right? So all the givers here and the gift of helps over there and showing mercy there and, and so on. So we subdivide all of the various groups. That's, that's verse one, that's the first thing. The supernatural giving of abilities, supernatural abilities by the Spirit of God to individual believers. But then, suppose we had over here people who were involved in evangelism. And I come over to this group and now I notice that while all the people in this corner, I forget where I put the evangelist, maybe whatever, up here, all right? Uh, all the people in this group, while they have the same gift, they have the same toolbox, they have different ministries. I notice one works with children, one uh, is involved in Christian printing, and one is a cross-cultural evangelist, and uh, one works in prison work, and so on. So that it's quite possible to see an array of ministries and discover that all these people have the same essential gift. So, gift is the toolbox, ministry is the task that God gives me to do, which may be slightly different than someone else who has the same toolbox, but they're sent on a little different mission. So there's, there's the work of the Spirit in, in gifting us with a set of tools to use, and then the call of Christ, the head of the church, who says, I need you over here. I need you to be doing this right now. And he sends you on a particular mission, a particular ministry. Your tools will be, when you open up your toolbox, you'll have just the right tools for the job because the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are working in perfect harmony. But you'll be sent on a task and you'll find out that your, your abilities are just what are needed for that particular work. And then God the Father comes along behind and he brings the increase. Now this is very important for us to understand stage three. If you look at the two great preachers in the Old Testament, one would be Noah and the other would be Jonah. Noah preached 120 years and never saw a soul saved. Only got his three boys and their wives. Even his own brothers didn't get saved. They perished in the flood. Was he a bad preacher? No, he was a preacher of righteousness. In fact, the scripture says that it was Christ who was preaching through him, doesn't he? Peter tells us that. It was Christ preaching by the Spirit through Noah. Now Jonah, on the other hand, slouches into Nineveh. He wants these people to go to hell. He has no spiritual interest in them at all, and he gives them bad news. All he says is, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. There was no good news in it at all. Now he knew a lot more than that. In fact, in the next verse, next chapter, he tells us, I knew you were a God who was merciful, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. And Well, why didn't he tell the people of Nineveh that? That would have been a good second sermon, wouldn't it? But he doesn't tell them that. He just says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And then when they repent, he sits up on the hillside and says, God, give it to them. Give it to them. They repented. Oh, I knew you were that kind of a God. I knew you'd let them off. Well, you see, the measure of blessing is not in our hands, is it? It's in the hands of God. So if you look at Bill Deans going into Central Africa, and they saw hundreds of assemblies started, thousands of believers saved in Northeast Zaire. And then Bill Deans went to visit up in North Africa. He went to see um, um, Brother uh, 
Don't get old. Uh, he wrote the book Too Hard for God. Marsh, Charles Marsh. He went to see Charles Marsh, and he told the amazing things that God was doing there uh, um, uh, in, among the Bantu peoples. And uh, then he said, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some of the Christians around here. And Charles Marsh said, well, brother, the ones I'm sure of, I'd have to take you to the graveyard to show you. Their throats slit as soon as they confess Christ. Well, does that mean that Charles Marsh was a bad missionary and Bill De Deans was a good missionary? No. No, it means that God gives the increase. That the, the blessing, the end result is in the hands of God. The, the tools are in the hands of the Spirit. He gives us the tools. The Lord Jesus then sends us on a ministry that suits that, and the Father comes behind and accomplishes his own purposes as he sovereignly will. So there we have the three dimensions to the giving of gifts. And here you see in this little section under differing groupings of the gifts, I first mentioned 1 Peter chapter 4, and we, we don't uh, have to turn to it. I've got the, the significant portion quoted there. Um, the different groupings of gifts now that we want to think about. As each one has received a gift, minister it one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers or serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. So he says, if you're speaking, the speaking gifts, and they would include quite a number of the gifts that we'll look at later, the speaking gifts, make sure that when you speak, you speak as the oracles of God, as if God was the one speaking. No place for trying out your pet theories, no place for lambasting the Christians, no place for uh, trying to play to the crowd and let everybody know that you're orthodox and check off, oh yeah, he's, he's still on the line because he, he rails against all the proper things. None of that stuff, brethren. No politics. We are there to speak as the oracles of God. Is that what God would say to his people? Well, then don't you dare say it if God wouldn't say it. He's taking the meeting and you're speaking as the oracles of God. What a solemn thing that is. And then serving. That as you serve, don't try and use your own resources. Why, you'll run out in no time at all. You're serving. You're a servant of the Lord. So if, if I were to give money to someone and they say, oh, I'm just so indebted to you. I say, well, no, not to me. It wasn't my money. Oh, it wasn't. No, no. No, it's the Lord's money. I'm just, I'm just the steward of it. I'm just passing it on. Do you know there's not one occasion in the New Testament where Paul thanks the Christians for a gift, a financial gift? He always thanks the Lord. He always thanks the Lord. I thank my God on every remembrance of you. He always thanks God for it because he realizes that God deserves all the glory. And that's what Peter says here. If anyone serves, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. Whatever I'm doing, people say, oh, brother, that was such wonderful ministry. I say, well, <laughs> it wasn't mine, you know. I, I got it out of this book that God gave me, and it was his spirit who taught me. And, you know, if he didn't help me, I wouldn't have understood a thing of it. It's all the Lord, isn't it? From start to finish, it's the Lord working through his people to enrich them. And when we acknowledge that, well... God is glorified, isn't he? That's, that's what Peter says. That's the end result. God is glorified. When people say he's really gifted, you know, the word gift is a bit of a clue, isn't it? <laughs> he had nothing to do with it. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. And so every blessing, every encouragement, every bit of truth you receive, every, every uh, exercise of, of ministry in the life of the local church we ought to trace it back to the head. Trace it back to the headwaters. The, the dew of Hermon coming down from God. The anointing oil coming down from the head. Every blessing, we trace it back to these three sources. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And from them comes the blessing into the lives of God's people. You see then what a solemn thing it is 
to stop up the flow, to not exercise my gift. It's not mine, is it? The blessing, the truth that I receive, the encouragement that I could pass on, the financial help that I could give, uh, the mercy that I could show, it's not mine. The Lord has sent it through me, and here I am building this dam and holding back the grace of God, holding back the blessing of God. You see how important it is then for every one of us to know what our gift is and what our ministry is and to get on with it, because it's through us that God's blessing is coming into the lives of others. God does not act independently. He sends his blessing through his people to his people. And we have a solemn responsibility to do that. Well, we mentioned that, that Paul in the book of Ephesians distinguishes between the foundation gifts and the maturation gifts. The foundation gifts, the apostles and prophets laid the foundation. Though we do not have them with us today, we have their ministry with us today in the word of God, apostolic authority and prophetic utterance. But then... We notice as we read through these passages, in 1 Corinthians especially, that Paul is going to make some other careful distinctions and what we might call not only the maturation gifts, that is those gifts that are designed to build up the body, but also confirmation gifts. Because remember there's a transition period here where the gospel has gone first to the Jew and the Jews required a sign, a sign of authentication that this was truly the work of God. And Joel too had prophesied that there would come a time when certain signs would be manifested to guarantee to the Jews that this was truly a work of God. But as the Jews officially rejected the gospel, and as the disciples then went more and more to the Gentile nations, these confirmation gifts lost their significance and they slowly disappeared from the church. And instead, the other gifts took precedence and the work of God carried on without these sign gifts, without these confirmation gifts. And we'll notice as we read through these little sections the distinctions that are made. Notice uh, some, of the, some of the points that I'd like to make here. First of all, that Paul said these gifts would cease. We, we'll look at that in a moment in 1 Corinthians 13. Secondly, that those gifts, those, those confirmation or sign gifts, are only mentioned in Paul's 1 Corinthian passage. You won't find them listed in um, Romans 12. You won't find them in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4, or 1 Peter 4. They are found only in this section, 1 Corinthians 11 through 14. So that at that time, these things were still in effect. But by the time we come to the end of the writing of the New Testament, they are a non-issue. Number three, historically, that's exactly what happened. Paul said they would cease, and they did. So that the Anti-Nicene Fathers, shortly after the death of the Apostle John, in writing their commentaries on Corinthians said, we really don't know what this gift of tongues was. It had already disappeared from use in the church. So those are some important issues that we need to look at. And I'd like to um, point out to you the passage here in 1 Corinthians 12, something that we wouldn't catch in our English Bible, and that is that Paul breaks this list into groups by di two different words for another. There is the word alos and heteros. Alos, another of the same kind. Heteros, another of a different kind. And so in your text there, you'll notice, uh, do you see where we are halfway down page 14? Uh, the distinction between the various groups. Yeah, I've quoted the passage here um, in, from 1 Corinthians 12 that gives the list of gifts. And if you've got good eyes, you can see a superscript D or a super, superscript S after the word another. And that means another of a different kind or another of the same kind. And by looking carefully at these, we'll see then that Paul breaks this into three sublists. All right? So, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another of the same kind, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Then to another of a different kind. So you draw a little, a little diagonal 
a little line there. This has broken it into, into uh, the second grouping. So the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge are the same kind. But then faith, healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, these are another, another grouping. And then we come to the last section. You have another of a different kind, tongues and interpretation of tongues. So he marks off, by the use of this word, another of a different kind, he marks off two at the beginning and two at the end. The two at the beginning are the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And the two at the end are tongues and interpretation of tongues. Why would he do this? Well, he goes on to explain in chapter 13 why he did it. He says um, in chapter 13, in verse um, 8, love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now here he means the gifts of prophecy. All right, It's not prophecies. The prophecies are there in the word of God. They're, they're secure. But the gift of prophecy, um, and certainly the gift of knowledge, it wouldn't be knowledge that would pass away. It's the gift of knowledge and the gift of tongues. These three, he says, are going to disappear. Four, verse nine, we know in part, we prophesy in part. So he says, at this point, in the writing of 1 Corinthians, we have a partial knowledge of the things of God. It's, he uses an example of incompleteness. And then secondly, he uses an example of immaturity, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. He's not talking about putting away tinker toys here. He's talking about putting away childish forms of expression and communication. In the early days of the church, this was a childish form of expression. It was, it was marked the immaturity of the church required this. But as the church grew up, this childish form of expression passed away. Verse 12, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And here's an example of imperception. The phrase face to face means mouth to mouth. And it's the word used for Moses and God. God spoke to Moses differently to the others. He spoke directly mouth to mouth. No visions, no types or shadows, direct communication. The Old Testament scriptures were through a glass darkly. There was a, tr a dramatic change in the ministry of the Lord Jesus when they said, now we know he speaks plainly. And with the completion of the canon of scripture now, we don't need a people who have these special gifts of discovering the mind of God. Every one of us can open up the scripture and we can see it for ourselves. So the three that are going to pass away, he says, are the gift of prophecy and tongues and knowledge. Now, there are, there are different words used for the passing away. He says, prophecy shall fail, tongue shall cease, knowledge shall vanish away. In the Greek, the word fail and the word vanish away are the same, but the word cease for tongues is different. This word for fail or vanish away is a causal relationship. It would pass away as a result of something else. Now, you can understand that when the scripture was complete, the gift of prophecy was defunct. It was, it was no longer needed because all the prophetic scriptures were given, the Bible was complete. And likewise, the gift of knowledge, which I mentioned later, is a supernatural ability to understand the principles of scripture before they were written. So that if someone had a question about this doctrine or that, they could go to someone with the gift of knowledge who could communicate divine truth to them before it was ensconced in scripture. So obviously, again, it, once the scripture was complete, we would no longer need the gift of knowledge. What we would need now is the gift of teaching, right? And what do you know? When you look at the list, you'll discover that this is true, that the word of knowledge passes the gift of teaching continues. The word of wisdom passes and the gift of exhortation continues. So the distinction is made here, and you may have some questions about this later in our Q&A time, but I leave that with you. I think it's important to see that, that tongues, the word for cease there, is not a causal relationship. It would pass away because tongues was to be a, a sign, an evidence of something. And now with the completion of the canon of scripture, scripture was its own proof. 
The power of God was invested in the scripture, and now the scripture would prove itself. You don't have to prove a sword is a sword. A sword makes its own point, right? It proves itself. And so there was no need now for sign gifts to authenticate that what these people were doing was truly the work of God. Now they had the word of God, and the word of God was its own authenticating proof. It is living, and it accomplishes its own work, whatever it sets out to do. So there is another distinction made between these various gifts. Uh, tongues would not automatically stop with the completion of the canon of scripture, but it would fade away. And after that point, after the completion of the canon of scripture, those who had the gift of tongues could use that gift, but eventually it was not replaced, and church history tells us that's exactly what happened. Now, we're on page 15, and we want to think about um, the list of gifts the middle of page 15, the list of gifts. We have four lists. Of course, there is a kind of a quasi list in 1 Peter 4, which simply describes speaking gifts and serving gifts in general terms. And in Ephesians 4, we saw that the list of gifts there is a different category of gifts. They're given by Christ, not by the Spirit. They are given, uh, they are individual men who are given, not abilities given to people and they are for the well-being of the universal church, wider than any local assembly. But here we have uh, the lists, and I've laid them out for you. They're not in order. I just wanted to lay them out in a way where you could see that uh, prophecy is the only one in all four lists. We see the primacy of the word of God in this. But uh, you will notice, for example, uh, the word of wisdom in Corinthians is seemingly replaced by the gift of exhortation in Romans 12. Um, you'll see that um, the uh, gift of helps is seemingly identical to ministry, the gift of ministry in Romans 12, and the gift of governments similar or identical to the gift of ruling in Romans 12. So we have this list, and now what we want to do in the next few minutes his look at some suggestions as to what these gifts were. And I'm just going to, sorry about this folks, this is going to be remedial reading. I'm just going to read this little section to you. Apostles, given authority to settle foundation issues, such as the Gentiles' relation to the law, and to give definitive answers for the establishment, for the foundation of the church. They dealt with these fundamental issues. And as I mentioned, it's a good thing that the early churches got into absolutely every possible problem they could because we have answers to every possible problem. Isn't that great? It's all there uh, in black and white to help us through our own problems. Prophets, the unveiling of hidden truth, the explanation of the types of the Old Testament, the clarifying of seeming contradictions, and the selections of the books of the Bible. The prophets were responsible to give us this magnificent book to complete it, the new covenant, with the old and to give us a, a complete revelation of God's truth in the book. And then evangelists, as we noticed, blazing new trails for the gospel, articulating the message of the gospel and training a generation of witnesses. We notice that in Ephesians 4, the primary burden of the evangelist is not only to see souls saved, but in the process to train others so that they can do that work. Something we need to see more of. Pastors, I call them pro tem elders. In other words, when a group of Christians got saved in some new region, uh, these men would move in, people like Timothy and Titus, they would stay with this little company of Christians, and just as the evangelist reproduced his gift in establishing witnesses, now this man, a pastor, a shepherd, would reproduce his gift in seeing the raising up of godly elders in this new flock of believers. We think it would have to take 30 years to do it. The most they, they used in any church, as far as we know, was two years. The most. They started with raw pagans, they left with functioning elders. If you think an elder has to be saved for 30 years, they didn't know about that. They wouldn't have had elders, would they? So uh, the, the, the most mature believers among them had only been saved two years, but they were left them as functioning elders in the local church. 
They were not watching the Late Late Show. You can be sure they were doing double time in the Word of God if they were going to be ready in two years to be elders over the flock of God. And so the, this was the role of the pastors um, to establish the churches, to confirm the saints, to train and recognize the elders. Then they packed their bags and they moved on somewhere else. And so the idea was these, these gifts were hopscotching across the Roman Empire. The evangelists breaking new ground, seeing people saved and baptized. Then the, the shepherds coming in, pro tem elders working with the flock, working themselves out of a job. Not building the work around them, but working themselves out of a job and recognizing local elders and then moving on. And then would come the teachers, men like Apollos, who would come into town not to simply reproduce what the local teachers were doing, but to help the local teachers to raise the bar, to help them understand more of Scripture, to show them maybe venture into new areas of Scripture, and to teach the saints how to study the Bible for themselves. Every child of God should be a Bible student. Not every child of God is a scholar, but everyone should be a student of the Word of God. I think we've retreated from that a bit, and we need to get back to it. We need to be students of the Word of God. Now, if we're not seeing anybody saved, I suppose we can afford a couple of students per assembly. But if, if God dropped 8,000 new Christians into our lap, there were 120 believers, you can be sure every one of them was helping those new Christians get founded in the Word. And if God began to save lots of souls among us, all of a sudden we'd all have to get involved in that, wouldn't we? And that's what we need to see. That's what we need to anticipate, that God will do this and we need to get ready. The word of wisdom we've already mentioned, and the word of knowledge. The gift of exhortation, encouraging practical biblical change in others, showing people where they were wrong in such a way that they want to make it right. Now that is a supernatural gift, isn't it? Showing people where they're wrong in such a way that they want to make it right. This is a very needed ministry among the people of God. We are too touchy. We are too too easily offended. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We need to be more ready to respond. Do you want to make the same mistake for the next 50 years, brother? <laughs> well, encourage the exhorters who come to you and say, brother, here's an area of your life. Now, exhorters, they have to live lives that are straight up and down. They have to be consistent. They have to be open themselves. There are some people who can really dish it out, but they can't take it themselves. And an exhorter has to be willing to humble himself and say, you're right, I haven't lived this the way I should either. Let's, let's learn together. So an exhorter is someone who encourages the Christians in practically developing and changing and becoming more Christ-like. I skip over the word of knowledge. We refer to that, the gift of faith. The gift of faith is trusting God for a great deal in such a way that it inspires others at least to trust him a little more. If George Mueller can trust God for 2,000 orphans, maybe I can trust him for two. And so the gift of faith is something that shows how great God is and inspires the rest of us to venture out a little more in trusting him as well. The gift of healing, the ability to reverse some visible effects of the curse as a living parable of deeper spiritual truth. We still believe in God healing. The question is, are there healers? That's the question, isn't it? And when we look at the New Testament again, we notice this transition. At the beginning of the church age, Paul was going out and lifting Eutychus off the ground, who had dropped dead, and pulling him back to life again. Pretty impressive stuff. But by the end of his ministry, he couldn't even get over his own little thorn, whatever that was. And he, and he prayed for Epaphroditus that he be healed, and he told Timothy to take a little medicine for his stomach why didn't he just heal the man? Why didn't he heal Epaphroditus? Well, it seems that those sign gifts were transitioning out of the church. And so uh, it, it was a valid, a valid ministry at the time, but it has passed from the scene. We still believe that God is Jehovah Rofika, the healer God. We still ask him to heal, but we realize that this matter of healers is a different thing entirely. Uh, the gift of Miracles, a more general term, the ability to give people a taste of the coming millennial reign of Christ. This is what it would be like if Christ was supreme in the world. The Lord Jesus said, if I with the finger of God do these miracles, then surely the kingdom of God has come among you. 
This is evidence that if I were king, this is what it would be like. And that's what the gift of miracles was, giving the Jews a taste of what it would be like if they had accepted him as king. And again, that's, that has largely passed from the scene. Can God do miracles today? Thank God he can. I wrote a book on it, <laughs> on God doing miracles in the lives of his people. But uh, the question is, is the gift of miracles still here? I don't think so. But if you disagree, you'll still love me, right? Good. All right. The gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues, we've already referred to that. Uh, an ability to communicate the gospel to a needy soul in a known but personally unlearned language. There is no evidence in the scriptures that tongues was anything but a, a language with, as he says, signification. In other words, a language where every word had meaning in someone's tongue and, and they had that ability to speak it. Uh, then we have the gift of discernment. The ability to see things not as they appear, but as they really are, and convince others of danger. Not necessarily of danger. I think those with the gift of discernment can see spiritual gift in people. They can see ministries that people could perform. But they also see danger when people, other people don't see it. They see beyond the obvious, and they see danger, and they raise warning. And we need to know these men who have discernment, these Christians with, with the ability to discern. Because that we might say, what is his problem? There's nothing wrong with that. Well, wait a minute. This brother has a gift of discernment. He sees things long before they develop. We ought to listen to this brother. But you know, there's some older Christians here, and your ministry has been going on for years. You may have an ability to discern gift in some young Christian and to go to them and say, I see you've got some real ability in this area. I think the Lord's gifted you here. I'd like to encourage you in that. We need that, the gift of discernment. It's not easy to determine always what your gift or what your ministry is. And to have older Christians with their eyes open to see this and to encourage younger people in their particular area of development, that is a tremendously encouraging thing to do. The gift of helps or ministry. This is not going up and picking Kleenexes off the floor, ladies and gentlemen. We all ought to pick up dirty Kleenexes off the floor if we see them. In fact, when I go looking for young men to take preaching, that's what, one of the things I watch for. I watch for the young men who straighten the chairs, pick up the hymn books, pick up a dirty Kleenex when it's not their job. I say, there's a servant heart. God can use him. And those are the fellows I take along with me. I've never heard one of them preach before I take him preaching. I just want to see if he's got a servant heart. God can give you all the ability you need if you've got availability, if you've got a servant heart. You can get too big for God to use you. You can never get too small. And so that, that's not what the gift of helps is. The gift of helps or ministry is that strategic gift that knows how to step into the breach and help another Christian in their ministry where they become overloaded or distracted or overburdened at a certain point. And they know how to step in and to make another Christian's ministry effective again. They, they know how, as, as I mentioned here, um, to encourage and enlarge their effectiveness. They, need, they see that, that what this person needs is a little help in this area. And they have no interest in having their own ministry, their own highlights, uh, anybody knowing what they're doing. Their joy is to see other people's ministries flourish. And when they see someone struggling in a ministry, they step in. If they had their own ministry, they wouldn't have any time to do it. They're watching to see how they can help other people, how they can expedite someone else's ministry. It's a huge thing. We need to see more of it. There are lots of Christians with valid ministries who are struggling and not able to get off the ground with something. And all they need is someone to step in and say, here, let me help with that. And it would make all the difference. God has thought of that. That's a good ministry, the gift of helps. The gift of governments or ruling is at the other end of the spectrum. It's understanding how the gifts work together. We're in a body here. We're not just a liver lying on the floor over there and an eyeball over there. We're in a body. And that means the body parts have to work together. And you see, one of the problems is that because the gifts are different, they tend to rub each other. 
An evangelist, a true evangelist, can't stand sitting around with a bunch of baby Christians talking points of theology, like, what about the book of Revelation? They say, come on, let's get out there. Since we started talking, 186 people have gone to hell. We've got to get out there with the gospel. We don't want to sit around talking small talk here. Well, those young believers need their questions answered. And so men like Paul, who were blazing evangelists, they would have people like Timothy and Titus coming behind to sit down and answer those kind of questions. So an evangelist needs to learn how to work along with a shepherd, and that's true with many of these gifts. We need to work in tandem. And so those who have the gift of government or the gift of, um, of ruling, this isn't uh, an MBA. This is the ability to see how this person could really work well with this person and get them together and help them see the benefits of them working together and helping to coordinate the ministry of the body so that so that, you know, often we get so wrapped up in our own gift, we don't notice what other people are doing. And we get the idea, I wish some people had helped. The reason we think that way is because we don't think anybody's doing anything unless they're doing what we're doing it the way we're doing it, right? We need, we see everything through our gift. And I hear evangelists say, we need more evangelists. And the teachers say, we need more teachers. And the, you know, everybody sees it through their gift. Thank God for those people who stand back and see the whole picture. And they say, now here, we've got lots of good help in this area. Here's an area of our need. I don't know who has that gift, but whoever it is, I want to find them and encourage them because there's a lack in this assembly right there. And they stand back long enough to see the whole picture. That's this ministry of governing or governance or ruling. The gift of giving, a sensitivity to see material need and a strategic placement of resources to do the most good. It's not necessarily a large amount of money. I'd love to tell a story, but my time's all gone. But, but it's, not, it's not the amount of money that we have. It's having a heart for God's work. It's having a, a sensitivity to respond to the need at the time. And it's knowing how to maximize the resources for the most good. And then the gift of mercy, of showing mercy, a manifestation of the character of God in others' lives by showing a Christ-like grace in the face of need. One of the great, I think the idea of good works is very much a part of the gift of mercy. People who know how to go out of themselves and to sacrifice and to minister to others in such a way that God gets the credit for it. And people say, this is good. This, this, is, the, this is the kind face of the church as it reaches out to others. How to discover and begin using your gift. Our time's all gone, long gone. But let me just finish with this. There are people who think that the way to discover your gift is to go through uh, some sort of um, skill test. You know, uh, do you like people? Not very much. Do you like money? Yes. Well, okay, you have the gift of giving. You know, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But they have these little tests to figure out what your gift is. That's, that's, lean not to your own understanding. How are we going to figure out what it is. Well, if you look at the list, you'll see that there are 10 gifts for today. And each of us has been already commanded to do every one of them. Isn't that amazing? We've all been commanded to give, not just the ones with the gift of giving, to show mercy. We've all been commanded to be discerning, to have faith, to help, right? Even to lead. Make straight paths for your feet, lest those who are following you are turned out of the way. To teach, yes. Every one of us should be able to clearly explain why we believe what we believe to give a clear answer for the hope within us. So there's a sense in which all of us have been called to do all of these things. That doesn't mean we have gift in all of these areas, but as we're simply obedient, as we have opportunity to give and to show mercy and to help and do all of these things, whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might, the Spirit of God begins to nudge you into that area where you have an added measure where you have gift. It doesn't mean you stop doing the other things. Sorry, brother, I'd love to help you with that table, but I just found out recently what my gift is and it doesn't include helps. Well, you go ahead and help him with a table. We go on doing all these things, but now we know where our ministry should lie. Now we understand what God has equipped us for and we move in that direction. I'm afraid that most of us would have to say, instead of this one thing I do, these many things I dabble in. We've, we've reacted so much against one-man ministry, we've ended up with any-man ministry. Everybody, you know, if you've got two legs and a tongue, get them up on the platform. That is not 
scriptural. It is not biblical. We need to be discerning about various gifts and, and use people in their area of strength, in their area where they, where they have been equipped by the Lord. And we need to encourage that in the life of the local church. I had a word on deacons, but I'm afraid the deacons will have to wait for the night on elders. Uh, not that they're unimportant, but uh, we've run completely out of time. So thank you very much. It's a, a galloping through this section. I hope there are some good questions. Uh, we'll close just with a word of prayer. Father, our Father, how good thou hast been, how enriching to the church to think of such a thing that, that the God of heaven would put into the hands of others our well-being, that the only way I can truly be enriched and enlarged and equipped is by other people investing in me, and the only way they can be equipped is by me investing in them. And so thou hast put into our hands the blessing of others, so that as we minister to one another, we are knit together, we are bound together, we have a vested interest in one another and the success of the people of God. Help us to lay hold of this and to become obedient to all the things thou hast shown us. And in laying uh, our, our energies at thy feet, our bodies, our minds, our capabilities, to begin to discover that particular area where thou hast gifted us that will be a delight to us. Because according to the gift, so is the grace. Thou hast given grace to us sufficient to do the gift in a way that it's not a burden, it's not hard, it's a joy, it's a delight. Help us to discover this and to begin to function as a body, ministering to one another, building up the whole body for the glory of God and the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, we ask in his precious name. Amen. <laughs>